give people a couple more minutes to join. The reporter's on the fritz. Yeah, so we'll just wait a few more minutes while everyone joins. If you want to throw in the chat where you are joining us from, we'd really appreciate that. So for those of you just joining, we're just giving people a couple more minutes before we get started. Go ahead and throw in the chat where you're joining us from. Looks like we've got several people from Sydney, Melbourne, Singapore, Delhi, Taipei, Korea. Awesome. Fantastic. We've got people from all over, it looks like. So, so glad you're here and joining us. Okay, so for those of you who just joined, we'll kind of kick it off again. Um, again, I'm Janae Andres. I am the community manager for SALT Project, and we're very excited to have you guys here for this virtual meetup, um, particularly in this time zone. And we have Tom, who's our founder and creator of SALT. So Tom is here to speak to us about um, config management, kind of a config management 101, if you will. and um, so I'll do kind of a brief background on Tom. I'm sure maybe a lot of you are already familiar with this, but I want to walk you through. So Tom created SALT many years ago, and it is an automation software that just makes things easier. It's easy to use. It makes things better. And um, along those lines, we have our theme for our, our conference this year. We're doing a, a user conference for um, the SALT project. It's called SALT Comp. And our theme is bigger, better, faster, stronger, because that's what SALT makes everything, is bigger, better, faster, and stronger. Um, we're excited about that conference. If you want to learn more, you can go to saltcomp.com, and I will put that in the chat. We are actually looking for use cases of SALT right now. If you want to contribute to potentially speak at SALT Comp, we do have our call for speakers open right now. So that's my plug for SALT Comp, because I'm all about the conference. Um, and so going back to SALT and the beginnings of it, when it began, um, that was all created by Tom, and then it turned into SaltStack. And then SaltStack, um, as many of you know, was recently acquired by VMware back in October. And so the open source for Salt is still alive and well within VMware as the Salt project. And we keep Tom as our um, as our poster child for Salt because he's the creator of it. And we're so excited um, to be able to have him here today to speak to you. Um, there's really, I can't think of anyone better to be able to speak on this subject. So with that kind of background and overview of where SALT's from, where it's at now, um, I will turn it over to Tom to amaze and wow us. Um, he's really fantastic. We're very excited. Um, and before I embarrass him any further, I will also put in a couple of plugs for if you want to, if you really enjoy today and you want to see more of him, um, we do a video series called Salt Air, and it's on our YouTube channel, which you can find a link to on our main page, which is saltproject.io. Um, and we also have a podcast called The Hacks that Tom co-hosts on as well. We keep him very busy. So you can check out Salt Air on YouTube. You can check out The Hacks anywhere you listen to a podcast. And um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with Thomas Hatch himself. Take it away, Tom. All right, thank you very much for the uh, very generous introduction. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. And uh, hopefully you can all see my screen. <clears throat> uh, so I was uh, going to present on some basics today on Configuration Management 101 and to talk about a few of the core tenets of uh, what SALT is and what SALT does. Uh, but at the same time, I want to emphasize that uh, SALT is uh, one of the largest open source projects in the world right now, one of the largest open source developers that uh, what, what we can do with it now is very, very expansive. Despite the fact that I'm going to cover some basics around configuration management, please keep in mind that uh, SALT in and of itself is an extremely robust general purpose automation platform. 
And so I want to start by talking about uh, something inside of SALT that uh, we call the SALT management model. Now, when we come back and we look at configuration management and its origins, it goes back to the early 90s uh, when uh, a rather brilliant engineer named Mark Burgess wrote a paper about managing the state of a system. His idea was that if you could declaratively define the state of a system and then enforce it, then you would be able to maintain complete management um, of that system. And uh, I certainly agree with Mark to a certain extent. He's a fantastic fellow, by the way, and he's the creator of CF Engine. Uh, and I certainly agree that managing the state of a system is very, very important. But when we step back and look at how much more complex the world is now, how much more complex uh, data center management is, as well as cloud management. Uh, you'll see that we have a lot more to deal with than just managing the state of individual systems. And so we're gonna be talking about config management and individual system state management today inside of SALT and going over some of the basics, but the overall salt management model is more expansive than this. The idea is that we break things down into three major, major categories, state, or what I call state flow and event. State means, as I've been saying, that we enforce the continual state of a given system or more practically in today's world, a collection of systems. Flow, means that we can do one-off changes and queries. And this is really one of the core ideas around SALT. SALT is generally known for configuration management, but the, the spine of what SALT is, is a remote execution and event-driven automation platform. This remote execution platform is still the fastest way in the world to communicate with large numbers of systems in an efficient way. I long had a problem using uh, CMDBs. Uh, it sounds like there's a few people who are still, uh, who are still not, uh, not muted, that are making a little noise. So I long had a problem with uh, configuration management databases. CMDBs I felt were more often than not inaccurate and out of date. I found that the information inside of a database was often inaccurate within sometimes only a few minutes of the times when the queries were made. And the queries that it took to populate these databases tended to take far too long. Even those that were updated on a fairly regular basis, say once an hour, I felt were still not giving me sufficiently accurate information. And so the primary use case of SALT is this concept I call flow. The ability to ask your infrastructure virtually any question across the entire infrastructure and get a near immediate response, which is why we've had infrastructures that are managing not only tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of systems that are able to ask every computer in that infrastructure a question and get a response back in seconds to a few minutes. But since we can ask a question, we can also make a change. This means that manipulating even large fleets of, inf of uh, servers, uh, whether those are bare metal, virtual, or otherwise, um, or arbitrary devices, becomes something that's faster through salt than anything else. So again, that remote execution platform is at the very heart of what we do. On top of the remote execution platform is where configuration management comes in. Again, we are often pigeonholed as a configuration management system, uh, but this remote execution system is ridiculously fast. When we compare it to other systems that are used to manage large numbers of servers, the performance is uh, ridiculously better. 
one of the uh, one of my favorite comparisons was a, cust a current customer who was comparing us to Ansible, and they went and against fifteen thousand target systems, they were able to manage those fifteen thousand target systems with one salt master, and so they only needed one server to manage fifteen thousand systems, and when they decided to change a password for a user across 15,000 systems, it took SALT about two minutes. They did the same thing with Ansible. Ansible required eight servers to manage 15,000 systems. And the process of changing a password took a little less than three hours. When we come to real system management that scales, there are far more capabilities and, and matters of concern that need to be addressed than simply how easy it is for a developer to spin up uh, an automation platform. And that's again why I feel that the entire and all encompassing salt management model is very important. Finally, there's the event construct. The event construct means that a system produces events inherent and independent of how it is managed. Those events can happen because of natural things which are occurring on the system as it is functioning in its normal course of events. But events can also occur if a system is compromised or being improperly accessed. Being able to take this information across a broad base of possibilities is where we are able to create a complete distributed system management model that can be used again to manage any arbitrary type of device. Again, whether those systems are virtual machines, physical machines, or IoT devices, or even containers, being able to take a complete management view is the strongest differentiator that SALT has from really any other management system, open or proprietary. But the title of this presentation is Configuration Management 101. Sorry, 101. And so we want to start by focusing on configuration management. In SALT, we refer to configuration management as the state system. And it's managed using SALT states. Now, the idea here is that we're able to have individual states which define exactly how a system is meant to be configured. And then when we execute those states, then we're able to enforce how that system is configured. Now, who am I and why would you care? Normally I put one of these slides in the middle of my presentation that introduce, introduces myself, um, but Janae already did uh, more of that than I generally ask for. She gives me rather glowing introductions. Uh, but my name is Tom Hatch. I am the original creator of SALT. Um, I've also spent, uh, spent time managing and consulting on and helping build some of the world's largest infrastructures. So I'm familiar with infrastructures that are ranging anywhere from, again, a few tens of thousands of systems into hundreds of thousands. So I've got quite a bit of experience in distributed computing. I also have a background in cybersecurity. Um, and spent time working with the US intelligence community, although that's been a long time ago with the US intelligence community. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things to be aware of with the SALT's configuration management system. The first thing, oh my gosh, these slides must have not saved. It says Laura Mipsum in them still. Boy, is my face red. <laughs> the first thing I want to mention is something called an SLS file. SLS files, SLS stands for Structured Layered State. And this is, this is where we define what the configuration looks like. Those SLS files are then compiled through a data compiler. There are a lot of things that make SALT fast and a lot of things that make SALT performant. When you're managing a large scale infrastructure, the perform your management system needs to have the absolute minimum impact 
on the runtime of that system. The application is what matters, not the management of the system. Anytime I run into a management system that is uh, onerous and, and has a great deal of overhead, I get terribly upset. That's not what those compute cycles are for. They're for the application. And so SaltStack utilizes a data compiler, which is extremely efficient in translating the data from the configuration language into being able to enforce the configuration runtime. The runtime then allows us to manipulate a system to, uh, in an incredibly powerful way with tools that are only available inside of SALT's configuration management system. And then we're able to get extremely granular results with, from those executions. Now the configuration management system inside of SALT is both imperative and declarative. If we go and we look at the history of the biggest argument probably in configuration management, it is whether that configuration management system should be imperative or declarative. The argument for imperative is that imperative systems are simpler, they're easier to understand, and they're easier to write. It's easier for people to come up to speed and utilize them. But the argument for declarative systems is that imperative systems just can't handle as many use cases. Imperative systems are prone to errors and they're not item potent. If you execute an imperative routine multiple times, you don't have a complete assurance that everything is going to line up the way that you want it to. Whereas a declarative system allows you to have in place the tooling that means that every time you verify the state of that system, you have a complete assurance that it's going to be consistent. And so it is, I would argue, imperative that you have both an imperative and declarative system. A declarative system allows you to, again, have that item potent enforcement. But an imperative system is completely linear in nature. Everything runs in a deterministic way, one after another. So again, SALT always runs in the same order. SALT runs in the order in which it's defined inside of, S inside of the SLS files. SALT runs in, a, in an entirely predictable way, meaning it's very easy to understand how a system is going to be set up. But SALT also ships with all of the declarative tools that make it possible to take something which can be simply and easily set up in an imperative fashion, but make it run significantly faster, more efficient, and in a much more stable way. And even when using very simple salt states in such a way where they look like they're only imperative, they are also completely declarative under the hood. And so those definitions are very, very, very stable, very efficient, and extremely reliable. So let me transition over into a demonstration. Hopefully you can all see a terminal now. Let me actually... Make that a little bigger. I just want to interrupt now, to say I love when Tom does demos. They're always because they're you, you never like pre record them really. You just go and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I, I generally also enjoy the fact that uh, I make mistakes in demos. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but that's my favorite part. <laughs> All right. Salt itself can be run either with a salt master, which controls large numbers of systems, or it can be run independent on a loan system. I'm gonna start by showing a few of the basic pieces that we have inside of just running salt commands with a command called salt call. If you install salt on your laptop right now, you could follow along and run salt call commands. If, uh, if you go to salt or saltproject.io, there's links to documentation and how to install salt. Uh, if uh, you're running a Linux system, it's part of your package manager. You can apt-get install salt, yum install salt, pacman syu salt. 
If you're running Windows, we have an installer which can be downloaded and installed very quickly and easily. And if you are running on, uh, on, a, on Mac, uh, we also have a very simple and straightforward installer that you can download and install on your Mac very quickly and easily. Now, salt comes with a number of different commands. The salt command is used to communicate with the salt master to send out remote execution commands. This is really the, the primary way in which a lot of people interface with salt on a command line. Salt call allows us to do one-off commands, uh, typically on a local machine. And I'm gonna do a lot of my demos with salt call. Um, salt master starts up a salt master, salt minion starts up a salt agent or minion as we call them. Salt SSH allows us to communicate via an agentless system so that we're able to communicate with target systems over SSH and we don't have to install agents on those systems. And so let me actually start by executing salt call. When I call, when I run salt call without a salt master in place, I have to say dash dash local, uh, just to specify that uh, I'm gonna run salt right now and I'm not gonna try and communicate with salt master. And then salt comes with a giant litany of commands which abstract the system. One of the most simple commands is test.ping. It just returns true saying that, yep, this system is up and running. And running slow, uh, Zoom must be taking a significant portion of my, uh, <laughs> uh, of my CPU time. All right. All of these commands are internally documented. So I can run a command called sys.doc, which is going to give me every possible command which is loaded by this instance of salt on this system. As you see, it's rather extensive. Since I've overflowed my buffer on possible commands and documentation, and I'm still in the Zs, so if we want to see a little bit more, we can pipe this over to less and start scrolling through the fact that there are thousands upon thousands of possible commands, all of which have abstracted virtually every aspect of managing a system, everywhere from uh, using the alias system built into Linux in this case, to using file ACLs, um, to manipulating and calling Ansible components, directly uh, calling Ansible playbooks and, uh, and uh, executing Ansible commands, manipulating Apache servers directly. Working with archives of different type types, zip, zip files and tarballs, uh, even RAR files, making it easy to deploy software that's been packaged up even in something as simple as a basic archive. Um, let's see, and more and more and more and more pieces. Big IP load balancers, uh, we've got ButterFS manipulation and control. Lots of that. Let's see the build out system, building shroots, cloud manipulation. Anyway, it goes on and 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 on. We had some manipulation of console in there, disk management, so you can query any anything about the disk um, or make changes to disks if uh, if you are so bold. Uh, Ruby gems directly manipulating Git. Uh, Gluster FS integration, Grafana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list is, as you can see, ridiculously long. So let me do a couple of salt call commands just to introduce you to a few of these. One system that we're rather proud of is the package system. The package system abstracts package managers across virtually all operating systems. And so I'm able to say package.list packages, and it's going to give me a report about all installed software on my system. 
That is regardless of whether or not I'm running Linux or Mac or Windows or virtually any Linux distribution or multiple versions of Windows and Mac. It gives me a list of all installed pieces of software and their subsequent versions. And that, and that list is normalized regardless of, the, uh, regardless of the operating system that we're running on. Similarly, we normalize access to network components. And so I can ask Saul to tell me about all of my network interfaces. And it's going to return this information in a completely consistent way across all operating systems. And so you can see there's my MAC address published on the web yet again. I should probably spoof some of these before I do these demos. <laughs> One of the other things that's great about this interface is that we try and make all of these commands return and look fairly pretty, but all of the information underneath the hood is JSON serializable. This means that all of this information is structured and inside of data structures, which can be easily exported in a programmable way and imported and managed with third-party systems. So as you can see, it's just some JSON data under the hood. And that's true for virtually any command that we run. Now, let me step back and uh, refocus a little bit and start to zone in on states some more. There's one more concept I wanna mention before we get there though. And that is a concept inside of SALT called grains. Grains is a set of system data that we gather about the operating system that we're managing. This is very critical because we need to be able to know what's going, where we are. Otherwise, how would we be able to normalize access to these systems? How would we be able to make a programmatic determination as to whether or not we're on Linux or Windows or whether or not uh, we're on different versions of Linux? As we can see inside of the grains, we've got a litany of uh, static information, or I should say fairly static information about the system that we're running on. Uh, everything from network information, again, to the kernel that's being run on, to the uh, lower level kernel release, uh, to the fact that uh, you all know, now know that I'm running Arch Linux. Uh, there's, uh, there's an old joke among Arch, Arch Linux users, which is, uh, how do you know if someone's using Arch Linux? They'll tell you. Like I just did. Okay, it's so. So true. So, true. <laughs> <laughs> so grains are very important, but now that you've got kind of a high level overview of the fact that salt has a huge library of commands and capabilities, let's dive a little more deeply into configuration management. Now, SALT's configuration management uses SLS files, like I mentioned earlier. SLS files are incredibly easy and easy to put together and try to be very, very self-explanatory. We start by defining um, a state block. In this case, we've named it Apache. What we're gonna be doing is making sure that the Apache web server is installed and running. Pretty simple. We say Apache and then say package.install to say, let's make sure that that package is installed. Then we say service.running. Let's make sure that the Apache service is running. In this case, I'm gonna be doing this demo on Arch Linux. The package on Arch Linux is called Apache. And so it inherits the package name from this high level identifier here. If we don't want the top level identifier to be the package or service name, we can override it with a name argument. The name argument is present in every single uh, state definition that we have instead of salt. But again, this should look pretty straightforward. 
we're installing Apache and we're making sure that it's running. And I'll worry about this component here in a second. To execute these states, all we have to do is call the state.apply execution command. So everything is still running through the same pipes. We call that command and salt fires up, takes a look at uh, this httpd.sls file and it applies the definitions therein. Upon applying the definitions, we're able to come back and see that, yep, oh, Apache was already installed. It took 86 milliseconds or just shy of 87 milliseconds for that uh, verification. It detected that the, and so it had to make no changes to the system, as we can see in the changes block here. And we see that all specified packages are already installed. But then the service wasn't running, so we needed to start up Apache. So again, very straightforward. Takes a little under 200 milliseconds to fire up Apache. And uh, the changes that have been made is that Apache has been turned on. Or in this case, of course, the HTTPD service has been turned on. So let's say that this is, I always do this. Let's say that the service is not running and that Apache is not installed. So let's go ahead and manually remove that and let's run it again. So of course, this time it's gonna go out and it's going to ensure that Apache is installed. It's going to install all the dependencies of Apache. It's going to tell me every version of the software which was either updated or installed during that process. It's gonna tell me exactly how long that installation took, a little under four seconds. We see that we've, we've just installed Apache 2.4.48. Salt is of course able to explicitly define the uh, version of any piece of software that we want to install and do comparative versions. That entire component tree is all there. Um, and we've got Apache up and running. So again, a salt state, an SLS file is very, very, very simple and straightforward. All right. Now I go back to my slides. And every time I do that, I forget where my little Zoom drop down bar is. All right, seems very, very straightforward. But SALT, of course, is significantly more powerful than what we're looking at. SALT comes with a system called the requisite system. The requisite system means that we are able to create relationships between multiple, uh, multiple definitions inside of SLS files. These relationships are critical in being able to define exactly how configuration management should be applied. Uh, I've got a couple of requisites here that are a little more common. The require requisite is far and away the one that's most used. It basically just says, I'm going to require some other component already, already be executed before I even try. Uh, the watch requisite does the same thing as require. Make sure that something else has already been successfully applied before I try but the watch also has an added benefit. If the thing that we're requiring has made changes to the system, then we will run an additional routine. The watch requisite is particularly useful when we're dealing with services. And so in this case, we're able to say that uh, the Apache service, for instance, can be watching the package, the Apache package so that it's very easy for it to be able to say, oh, the Apache package has been updated, changes occur. Therefore, the watch service will restart Apache, ensuring that all of the system, all, everything that's actively running on that system is properly connected and uh, congruent 
with the state that it should be in. The prereq requisite is one of my favorites, uh, not because it's used very often, it's frankly, it's kind of rare, um, but mostly because it was really hard to make. So I guess I'm kind of proud of it. <laughs> um, the prereq system allows you to make a change before another component makes a change. So that you can say, ah, this system's about to say up update its software. Before it updates its software, maybe I want to notify the load balancer and say, I'm about to run a, system, a software update on this system. Take me out of the loop for now. The thing that's brilliant about prereq is that it will detect whether or not changes are going to be made so that it's able to look at a salt state and say, is this going to make a change when I run it in a few seconds? And if it is, then we fire off the prereq, meaning, oh, say I've got a code deployment, I'm going to test it first. Will this code deployment activate? And so if it does, then we can say something like, stop, or stop a number of preparatory services before that code deployment activates. These sorts of sequences can be extremely useful in being able to not only deploy software, uh, but also being able to run specialized repairs. Uh, it's also very useful in things like database upgrades. And so now let me jump back over and let's take a quick look at how requisites work. In this SMS file, I've already got a simple requisite. We say that we're going to require the package Apache. And so it's pretty simply saying that we're not gonna try and run this service if the Apache package fails to install. And so let's, uh, let's make this happen. So let's screw up the name of the Apache service and let's run this again. And so now we have errors inside of our SLS file. And let's see what SALT does when it comes to detecting and managing those errors. Excellent. And so in this case, we were able to see that, yep, target not found. We were unable to find the package that needed to be installed. Subsequently, um, oh, we didn't even find the requisite in the tree. The, the package is, of course, going to look for the name. The requisite is going to look for the name of the package that we've, de that we've defined. So I've got to give it the right name. This allows us to create sequences inside of, uh, in, inside of our configuration management routine that they can operate independently. Other configuration management systems are very simplified in this regard, because what they do is they say, if anything fails, I'm just going to give up entirely. This can simplify the overall sequence and frankly, isn't necessarily a bad way to do things. But being able to have the additional power of being able to have independent sequencing in place can be very beneficial as well. But let's say that we want to do it the way that, um, the way that other tools were. Let's say that we want to just fail. If anything fails, we should just stop the sequence immediately. So we can turn on what's called fail hard. And hopefully I remember that name properly. I haven't looked at that in a while. <laughs> but that sets a trigger that, yeah, it looks like I forgot the name. We can look it up because everything is sub-documenting.
do you just type fail hard when you're not sure? Because then even if it fails, it's still technically accurate. So. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Oh, well, this is a system setting. All right. So we can go into the configuration and set fail hard to true. You know, it's embarrassing when I'm when I'm demoing a feature uh, that that I literally wrote and uh, and I get it wrong. I've, I've written too many components. There's just there's too much brilliance in your head for you to make sense of it all. You need a filing system. If you, you've, you've really got you're really going to stop doing that today. OK. <laughs> She just talks me up too much because she knows it embarrasses me. All right, so we tried. I, <laughs> I acted, activated the fail hard system, and now we see that as soon as it hit one failure, it stopped. As you uh, may recall, in previous runs, we were executing two. So, in a nutshell, if there's a mode or way of thinking that another configuration management system delivers, SALT also is able to deliver that mode or, or way of thinking. So another example, for instance, is the fact that um, SALT's configuration management uses these SLS files that are written just using YAML, because YAML is pretty easy and straightforward. Um, but some configuration management systems argue that you should have a full-blown DSL. SALT ships with multiple DSLs because the language layer was originally built to be pluggable. And so you can write salt states in pure Python uh, using, uh, uh, using a DSL that we call PyObjects. Uh, similarly, they can be written using JSON. So there's a significant amount of flexibility there. All right, so I mentioned the require requisite, but let's change this to watch. Like I said, the watch requisite will detect if there are any changes in, uh, in the underlying, uh, in what it is watching, in this case, the package installation. And if there are changes, it will restart that service. So we see there are no changes. The service is already running. So let's uninstall Apache again and give it another go. At this point, there will be changes in Apache, which should invoke a restart. And since I'm running Arch Linux, the act of uninstalling Apache should not necessarily have stopped the Apache service. That's a Debian thing. That's a, you know, that's their game. For whatever reason, it's being really slow to install Apache. Excellent. And so we see that, um, uh, yeah, okay. This is, this is a lovely little, little tidbit here. I'm running Arch Linux. Arch Linux is a rolling release. Arch Linux recommends that you always run a full system update every time you install anything. While we were talking, inside of Arch Linux, a new version of OpenJDK came out and was updated. That's just normal how Arch Linux runs. For every system platform, we always use the recommended defaults. This is actually really cool. I've never had this happen during a demo before. We, <laughs> we always use the recommended system defaults, but give flags to allow changing it. And so inside of the Arch Linux settings, for instance, you can turn off that it does a full system update when it does those checks. It does not do a full system update for other operating systems because other operating systems don't have that recommendation. Okay, that's why it took a little longer. We downloaded Java while we were waiting for that. Um, and the process of downloading and installing a new Java took a whopping 15 seconds. Okay. 
But as you can see, yes, the service was restarted. And it was restarted. It was not started originally. So the service was running. It detected a change in, in uh, the watched package and was restarted. And so again, these, this is just some of the power of the requisite system in being able to create these relationships. All right. The reason why SLS files are called structured layered states is because they're layered. They, the idea, so originally SLS stood for solved state because I wasn't very creative um, and, and I'm embarrassed even to say it, but I recently changed the name to structured layered state because I've been using that file format in other projects. The idea here is that the output of the file is going to be structured data, uh, but also that it allows that file to be layered through multiple plugin and rendering systems. Like I was saying before, uh, we allow these SLS files to be defined using a DSL or JSON or really anything that can output structured data. Again, though, we can also add Jinja or templating. So the default templating language that we use is a templating language called Jinja. And so let's say that we wanted this to work on, and this is where I'll mess up because I don't write a whole lot of Jinja anymore. Let's say we want this to work with more operating systems than just Arch. Actually, let's say Even though I'm not running on a Red Hat system. Um, Tom, we can see your slide, not your code. Really? Yeah. Well, that's embarrassing. There we go. Thanks. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna look at the grains that I mentioned earlier and say, if those grains say Red Hat, then we should change the name of the package. This again, makes it easy for us to begin to make states that can be applied for multiple packages. And then I probably have a syntax error in there because like I was saying, I haven't, I don't, this isn't my day job anymore. Yeah, change of variable OS is undefined. Do, do, do. Could remember if I needed to quote this or not. That's promising. There we go. This allows us to maintain very simplistic logic inside of our salt states uh, while still giving us complete Turing logic around it. Uh, but again, this also means that it gives you, the person who is defining how these systems are, are maintained in an unimportant way, a significant amount of flexibility as to how that definition is defined and maintained. It also allows us to create significantly more terse code because we're able to arbitrarily switch out virtually any block 
inside of uh, in, inside of the SLS file. And again, similarly, if uh, you don't like Jinja, uh, we can use different different templating languages. So, for instance, we can come up here and use uh, what we call a render pipe to say maybe we want to use the Mako rendering system and then YAML or the Mako rendering system and then JSON. This allows us to be so flexible in being able to say that we even potentially have SLS files that are defined using uh, different rendering systems inside of a single run. This is particularly useful because a significant number of SLS files that are used to define a system are very simple and straightforward, but it's nice to have a few very powerful tools in your back pocket, just in case you're running into the, say, 5% of instances in an infrastructure where you do need to do some rather tricky work and you can pull out a significantly more powerful tool like the Python DSL. And uh, all we need to do is a little shebang here and say pi objects. And now we can define this file using a different format. All right, I am running rather short on time, but I'm also running rather short on presentation. And so we're back on my slides, I hope. And I showed how to use dem, how to use uh, Jinja, and we've talked a little bit about grains. And so this is the point where I say, does anyone have any questions, comments, arguments, or rebuttals? I'll preface that with there is a huge <laughs> litany of things which were not covered. Just some of the very simple basics. We didn't even talk about how remote execution works. And so uh, go ahead and hit me with uh, any any question you'd like. And uh, we'll we'll see we'll see uh, what I can do with that. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And feel free to go ahead and take yourself off mute if you have a question. Also, if you'd like to um, weigh in on any topic you'd like to hear Tom speak about, or on anyone else on the Salt Project speak on, go ahead and just throw the topic suggestion in the chat. We'd love to do more of these virtual meetups um, at this time um, on maybe a monthly basis to be able to connect with more people in the APJ region. So if there's a topic that um, you'd love to hear more about, just please throw that in the chat. And if you have any questions for Tom in the last couple of minutes, feel free to go off mute and, and ask your question. And Tom, I really appreciate pretending to make mistakes during your demo just for my entertainment. That was great. I did make mistakes. <laughs> I don't do these as much as I used to. <laughs> I, I used to I used to do these five times a week. It seemed like it's true. I feel like I've been being too light on you lately. I need to make you work harder, which is a joke. You have no free time. Okay, Tim, what's your question on ACLs? I was just wondering, uh, what's the easiest way for a non-root user on the Salt Master to know what hosts they have access to send commands to or to interact with um, if you've got ACLs turned on? I've had to script something up to, to use a collection of, of grains and a script to kind of iterate through those for them, but I figure there must be an easier way. Uh, one of the easiest ways for some, okay, so so yeah, if you've got ACLs turned on on the Salt Master, uh, really the easiest way to, for them to see what systems they have access to, to is uh, um, uh, is to do a test.ping. So just do a, uh, you should be able to do a salt star test.ping. Um, and then that's going to just match everything that they have access to and it should just return. Um, is, is there a way to do that where it's more a quick answer that tells you back some combinations of grains or node groups that that match your permission rather than having to kind of create a scenario where you're doing an extensive query potentially across thousands of hosts? Um, 
I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's all right. Uh, there, there is because there is a way. I'm pretty sure that there's a. I, I think that there's a runner in there that can invoke the. Uh, uh, that can invo invoke the local matcher system. Um, so that you'd be able to invoke. So that you might be able to invoke a runner that is able to return that information. Um, but to be honest, uh, I'm not sure. And uh, so there's a chance that uh, you you can't, which is weird. Uh, I'm not used to being asked things that we can't do. Uh, yeah, so that, happy that's- to, Happy to help. You I found know, the one I, thing, I gotta, Tim. <laughs> I, I gotta write that down. It'd be a great feature anyway. Yeah, yeah, I would. Because, because you ask and uh, my, uh, uh, my question, <laughs> my mind goes in and says, yeah, I know exactly where that is in the code <laughs> and how we could get to that so it could be exposed. Um, maybe, maybe it needs to be. Um, okay, uh, another question. As assault.states.esxi salt release at version 2015, 8.4 only supports vSphere 5.5 and 6.0. How about roadmap with vSphere 6.7 and 7? Um, as, as you may have guessed, uh, we are hard at work to make sure that all VMware products are updated. Uh, vSphere is a top priority. And so we're looking, uh, we're looking to get that, uh, we're looking to get that taken care of very, very soon. Um, again, off the top of my head, I can't tell you the exact release, uh, but the goal on that is, is to get this VMware support added into releases as soon as possible. One of the things that, one of the first things that we've done inside of VMware, so we've been in VMware for uh, eight months and, and a couple of days now. And one of the first things that we spent the first few months doing was going out to a number of teams inside of VMware and training them on how they can extend and support their own software inside of SALT. Uh, and then subsequently, we've spent a considerable amount of time working with those teams to make sure that they are the ones who are inheriting the continued maintenance of their own SALT modules. And so this is, this is one of those cases of uh, we had an option to say, oh, we're in VMware now, let's dedicate all of our internal resources on to uh, updating VMware products, or we can develop a long-term strategy that can give us long-term maintenance. Uh, and so we've uh, been doing a long-term game uh, of making sure that uh, the right people are trained to support uh, SALT extensions for VMware products. And so, yes, that's something that uh, we hope to be Hope to come out soon. Uh, and again, the way that it's been implemented inside of VMware is so that we can see uh, long-term maintainability of these. Um, looks like we had another question. Unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but we really appreciate you guys all coming. If you wanna stay connected with SALT Project, I've put a few links in the chat to join us on Slack. We, spent, we have a lot of interaction in our Slack community. It's a very active group. Um, we have LinkedIn, we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we, there's a subreddit. Um, and of course, you can find us at saltproject.io, which is our primary site and kind of our key source of truth. So we really appreciate you all being here. I wish we'd had um, maybe a little more time for questions. We really appreciate the input from everyone. And Tom, again, thank you so much for being here and taking the time and connecting with everyone. Um, if anyone would like to connect with me or anybody else, um, we would love to hear from you. If you have topic suggestions for future meetups, you can reach us at saltproject at vmware.com. We'd love to hear from you and we look forward to doing this again soon. Thanks everyone so much for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Yep, thank you.